Good afternoon. And I welcome all of you to the 60th Leo Beck Memorial Lecture at the Center for Jewish History. Thank you all for coming. Many of you might be newcomers to the Leo Beck Institute and the Center for Jewish History, but there are also some longtime supporters here. I want to acknowledge our president, Rabbi Dr. Ronald Sobel, who's here. Um, and at the risk of missing other board members, I see uh, board member um, Michael Bamberger here. And uh, also, I want to thank Joel Levy, who's uh, the outgoing president of the Center for Jewish History. And do forgive me if I haven't seen others of you here. Um, the Leo Beck Institute was founded in 1955 by leading German Jewish emigre individuals um, who were determined to preserve the vibrant cultural history of German speaking Jewry that was nearly destroyed in the Holocaust. Rabbi Leo Beck agreed to serve as the first president. Sadly, he died a year and a half after it was founded, at which point the Leo Beck Memorial Lecture was established in his honor. The first lecture was delivered in 1958 by Fritz Bamberger, one of our founders, an educator in Germany and then here in the US, and the father of board member Michael Bamberger, who, as I said, is here today. Since that time, our lectures have been delivered by men and women from the academic world, from government, and from journalism who have provided critical perspectives on the history that we work so hard to preserve. We are privileged to have renowned journalist Roger Cohn deliver this year's Leo Beck Memorial Lecture. We have asked Roger to do double duty, if you will. Not only is this the Leo Beck Memorial Lecture, but it also serves as the keynote lecture to our series on German Jewish history in the now, which you'll see um, listed on the back of your program. The series was inspired by a generous gift from board member Abe Lowenthal and additional support from two other board members, Robert Rifkin and Lee Sander. The goal of this festival of ideas, which will take place over the next two weeks, is to demonstrate how we can learn from the past. German Jewish history is rich with lessons about migration, about assimilation, about accomplishment, about prejudice, and especially about resilience. We at LBI and the scholars who use our archives believe that by examining both the similarities and the differences between then and now, we can apply these lessons to contemporary issues. Your program lists several events, six to be total, bringing the past present. So I urge you to come, come learn about life for, more than, for the more than 200,000 Jews who live in Germany today. Or join in the conversation about what if the Weimar Republic had survived. Learn about how the Frankfurt School in the 20th century knew that Trump was coming. Compare German Jewish, his, German Jewish life in America today with the golden age of German Jewry a century ago. I encourage you again to read the descriptions and come to one or more event. I also encourage you to come to the events of our partner organizations as well as to see our interesting exhibits. Right now we have an exhibit upstairs uh, above the Great Hall, Becoming German Jews in America. And also I'd like to take note of our dinner on November 15th when we will present the Leo Beck Medal to Max Warburg from Hamburg, where we recognize Max's accomplishments as well as the history of the Warburg family, which is a rich history in transatlantic uh, relations. So turning to Roger, we are honored to have you here. Roger is a journalist who twice, whose twice weekly column in the New York Times has a special focus on international affairs that is deeply informed by his experience as a foreign correspondent in at least 15 different countries over four decades. Born in London to Jewish parents, he earned MA degrees in history and French at Oxford University before beginning his career reporting from among other locations, London, Brussels, Rome, and South America. Roger then joined the New York Times in 1990 and worked as the bureau chief in Berlin, as a correspondent in its Paris bureau, as the Balkan bureau chief, and the newspaper's European economic correspondent based in Paris before becoming the foreign editor for the New York Times in 2001. He is author of three books, 
Hearts Grown Brutal, Sagas of Sarajevo, an account of the wars of Yugoslavia's destruction. Soldiers and Slaves, American POWs Trapped by the Nazis' Final Gamble. And his most recent book, The Girl from Human Street, Ghosts of Memory in a Jewish Family, which was published in January 2015. That book is an intimate story about Roger's family from pre-war Lithuania to apartheid era South Africa, and then to England, the United States, and Israel. Much of the book focuses on the personal impact of events on Roger's mother, who is the girl in the book title, as well as those around her. We also had the honor to publish an essay that Roger wrote for our 60th anniversary. And to quote from that essay, the LBI's rich and varied mission is far from over as it celebrates its six decades. The mission is cultural, academic, and educational. Researchers and historians will continue to pour through the increasingly high-tech archives and collection of the Institute. But the LBI is also an important player in the transatlantic relationship. The Institute has been a constant bridge builder and the need for such bridges is unabated. These words provide proof that Roger Cohn knows about LBI, and we all look forward to his insights about German Jewish history in the 21st century. Thank you very much, William. Thank you, Rabbi Sobel. Thank you all for coming. This invitation honors me. Gosh, you know, Billy, I'd forgotten I was ever an economic correspondent. I'm not sure how I did that. It reminds me that the first qualification of a journalist is to be able to wing it. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you know the old Jewish cable. Start worrying, details to follow. I will try not to depress you too much at this delicate moment in the life of the United States, of post-war Germany, which of course is unimaginable without the American idea, and of the modern state of Israel. On Yom Kippur, I was in Berlin. I'm not a religious Jew, but on the high holidays, I like to be in a synagogue, listen to the ancient lilt of Hebrew prayer, and allow my mind to drift from daily cares. It's a form of respite. We all need that these days. Worry has become an early riser. I closed my eyes. The sounds of Jewish worship in the Pestalozzi Strasse synagogue were followed from time to time by instructions or explanations in German. This linguistic alternation in Berlin was more freighted than it might have been elsewhere. It was an affirmation of the colossal work of healing that's taken place, but it was not without a shadowy undertow. My mind turned to Paul Celan's phrase, the thousand darknesses of murderous speech, and to the complications for a post-war German Jew, or indeed any German, of having a mother tongue that was also the murder tongue. Nothing after the Holocaust is ever entirely straightforward in Germany, not even the jovial smile of the rabbi who conducted the service that day. Berlin is a city of absences. The Stolperstein, or stumbling stones, are now everywhere. The small brass bricks inlaid in sidewalks that recall a single Jewish life curtailed. What a beautiful name they have. You do stumble, you catch your breath, reminded of the everyday reach of the Nazi dragnet, of what fiendish diligence it took to decompose a rich German-Jewish world. Celan also wrote this, you say the distances grow bigger. No, on the contrary, they have not grown so much. The silence is the same. The words, whether uttered from here or there, how could they not resemble one another? Who isn't alone? Who isn't overwhelmed with all kinds of fears? This, I think, is a time of growing fears in Europe and in the United States. Ghosts, perhaps half forgotten, have stirred. 
Humanity, after all, never quite grows out of the buffoon's attractions. The scapegoats he offers, the fast money, the rush of violence, the throb of nation and flag, the adrenaline of the mob, the glorious future that will, he insists, avenge illusory humiliations. Isaiah Berlin noted that there was some truth to the conservative writer Joseph Demetre's view that, quote, the desire to immolate oneself, to suffer, to prostrate oneself before authority, indeed before superior power, no matter whence it comes, and the desire to dominate, to exert authority, to pursue power for its own sake, are forces that, historically, are at least as strong as the desire for peace, prosperity, liberty, justice, happiness, equality. I think, alas, this is right. The Enlightenment was not the end of the story. Nor was 1989 when the Berlin Wall fell, that giddy moment for freedom and for the liberal democratic idea, deemed at that point self-evidently all-conquering. No, an autocratic, nativist, xenophobic, white nationalist reaction is now in full swing on both sides of the Atlantic. It demands resolute vigilance. It also demands that we listen, try to understand, and not succumb here in America or in Europe to fracture. Fracture does loom in the United States these days. We're all locked in our ideological canyons, going to the social media that comfort us in the beliefs we already hold and seldoming, seldom venturing beyond them. On the wall of the synagogue in Berlin, opening my eyes, I noticed these words, Zerstort, November 9, 1939, Wiedereingewehrt, September 1947, destroyed in 1938, rededicated in 1947, a year before the founding of the modern state of Israel. In those nine years, yes, less than a decade, the German-Jewish tapestry of Charlottenburg, of Berlin, of Germany, was shredded. A whole universe disappeared. Hitler was a buffoon, but that did not stop him taking the whole world down with him. That's worth recalling today, ladies and gentlemen. Millions of European Jews, none more patriotic than the German, went to the gas. A new Jew would be born, the vigorous tiller of the soil in the valley of Harod, and orange groves would blossom from the parched earth of Palestine. But Europe and Germany lost a part of themselves forever. All that, of course, was in the 20th century, now disappearing from view at alarming speed. Few things are more dangerous than amnesia, and it strikes me right now that there's plenty of amnesia about with regard to, oh yes, the 20th century. But then, of course, the things you remember best are the things you've lived. I lived more than half my life still in the Cold War. But the Cold War was over when my two younger children were born. No wonder my daughter Adele found the last traces of the wall in Berlin when I took her to see them. See them. Unbelievable, her word. What is this, Dad? My title today is German Jewish History in the 21st Century, which is problematic because we've only had 17 years of it. So I'll indulge in a little preemptive history, always a treacherous occupation. But before I get to that, I'd like to suggest what was settled or resolved in the German Jewish Odyssey in the second half of the 20th century. The reconciliation of German and Jew after the Holocaust was near unimaginable. Death was Paul Celan's master from Germany. How could it proffer a hand across the ashes to those who had slipped through the net? And yet, just as there could be poetry after Auschwitz, Theodor Adorno notwithstanding, even if the Third Reich dem demonstrated the limits of culture, so there could, over generations, be a new understanding between perpetrator and victim, even German-Jewish friendship. 
I think no nation guilty of a great crime has pursued an honest, open reckoning and atonement with the vigor and rigor of Germany. It did not come immediately. It did not come easily. The country zigzagged its way to a full accounting. There were long silences. There were significant evasions. But I would say Germany got there. The Bundesrepublik has earned the respect of the world and the friendship of Israel through its conscientious examination of a shameful past and its absorption of the lessons of that past, evident in a vibrant liberal democracy today. And today, many young Israelis flock to Berlin. Of course, this institution, the Leo Beck Institute, has played a critical role in the healing through its dedication to the reconstitution of the world obliterated between 1933 and 1945. As I thought about my remarks today, my mind turned often to my late good friend, Fritz Stern, who once described to me the LBI as, quote, a monument that German Jewish refugees built as a memorial to their collective past, a troubled, anguished, glorious past to which many of them remained loyal, even as National Socialism sought to deny and destroy it. It's impossible to generalize about German Jews in the modern era, but common to most of them was an earlier deep affection for their country, its language, and its culture. Perhaps they loved not wisely, but too well. And the mission of this great German Jewish institution here in New York and elsewhere, Jerusalem and Berlin, continues. The question now is how can its achievement and the extraordinary work of conciliation behind it be applied to the 21st century? I think Stern offers us a clue. I was born into a world on the cusp of avoidable disaster, he wrote in Five Germanies I Have Known. The cusp of avoidable disaster. The fragility of freedom is the simplest and deepest lesson of my life and work. Today, ladies and gentlemen, the fragility of freedom is all around us. We awaken to it on Twitter, those Twitter storms coming out of the White House. We experience it daily as a mild nausea. We go to bed with misgivings. We see it in rekindled bigotry, racism, and intolerance, declaimed by some people as if it were a kind of proud badge, giving free rein to your inner bigot as the best answer to political correctness. We see it in the rise of the rightist Alternative for Germany party. We see it in Donald Trump's America. We see it in the nationalist lurch in Benjamin Netanyahu's Israel. We see it in rising Islamophobia. We see it in rekindled anti-Semitism. Stern's phrase, the cusp of avoidable disaster, resonates. It may even give some of us goosebumps. Here, it seems to me, there exists a focus for German Jewish engagement in the 21st century. For that little hyphen connecting German Jewish would be unthinkable in a world controlled once more by the barbarians and buffoons who want to destroy connections, set us against each other once more. Isaiah Berlin reminded us of a truth about liberal democracy of which the founding fathers were mindful. The best that one can do is try to promote some kind of equilibrium necessarily unstable between the different aspirations of different groups of human beings. That's not sexy. Some kind of equilibrium is not what human beings ache to die for. It is, however, essential for the health of any liberal democracy, some kind of equilibrium. The post-war transatlantic architecture, of which President Trump is at once so ignorant and so contemptuous, was about preserving the gift of freedom. Let us, Germans and Jews, rededicate ourselves then to that task over the 83 years left of this century. Well, a few days after Yom Kippur, I drove out to Brandenburg and de Havel to interview an alternative for, G for Germany, AFD member, 
called Klaus Riedelsdorf. I've always believed that the essential task of the journalist is to be there and bear witness. Everything in my profession has changed since I was filing by telex from Beirut at the Commodore Hotel in the early 1980s. Everything has changed, but not the heart of the matter. If you don't see it, you don't get it. Be there, bear witness, hold power to account without fear or favor. Via telex or digital technology, it matters not. To dismiss the rise of the right without trying to understand it, and it is rising, is a mistake, whether in Germany or the United States. There was a lot of liberal arrogance behind Donald Trump's victory. The AFD, when I went out to see this gentleman, had just won almost 100 seats in the Bundestag, a watershed moment in post-war German politics. I wanted to understand the forces behind the rapid and troubling rise of the party. Well, Riedelsdorf presented himself to me as a German patriot, tired of German shame over the Nazi past, enough of Schuldkult or guilt celebration. He didn't give up East Germany, a vassal state to Moscow, to join a united Germany that he claimed is a vassal state to the European Union and Washington. We need to be sovereign in our land, he told me. Islam's an ideology, he said, and an Islamic takeover of Germany is the greatest danger to the country since the Cold War. Germany, he said, had suffered a refugee fiasco. Merkel let in what he called a million-strong army with stones from the Middle East in 2015, an irresponsible and crazy thing to do. Germany, he told me, has no special responsibility for Arab refugees just because 80 years ago we persecuted the Jews. I asked Riedelsdorf if Muslims are today's Jews for the AFD. He denied any analogy. He kept telling me how much he personally and his party like the Jews. He tried to argue that most Germans never had anything against the Jews. They followed orders. My grandfather and three of my father's brothers fought in the war, he said. They did what they were told to do, as any soldier does in the world. They tried to be honorable. The war was a crime, we know that. But soldiers didn't commit the crimes. That was the SS. We need a differentiated view of the Third Reich, he said. Well, there are several things to say here. The first is that Germany as Chancellor Angela Merkel realized to her immense credit, does have, does have a special responsibility toward refugees because 80 years ago it persecuted and tried to annihilate European Jewry. It incurred, Germany incurred, a moral debt without limitation. Germany knows, as no other nation, what closed doors can mean to the persecuted. Being from a Jewish family, I do too. That's in my bones. You don't become a refugee because you have a choice. You become a refugee because you've run out of choices. Today, some 65 million refugees and displaced people are on the move, more than at any time since 1945, and many of them emerging from the ravaged state of Syria. Shutting the door cannot Whatever the problems, whatever the issues, whatever the difficulties, shutting the door, slamming the door shut, cannot be the answer. Angela Merkel, raised in East Germany under the gaze of the Stasi, in the shadow of a wall, knew this with a particular conviction, and so, in my view, brought Europe back from the brink. This will stand through the 21st century as her finest hour. There may not be a Syrian-German Steve Jobs in the million-strong army of possibility, but in countless ways, great and small, German society will grow richer and better equipped for this century of flux. Perhaps Merkel's margin of victory in the election would have been greater if she'd travel banned the desperate. Perhaps littleness pays today. I doubt it in the German case. One lesson of its total annihilation was that littleness is capable of reducing the world to ruin. The second 
is that we do not need a differentiated view of the Third Reich. We need absolute moral clarity on the evil it perpetrated. The human traits that buttress violent systems of racist oppression and murder, and I refer to fear, envy, tribalism, resentment, conformism, nationalism, opportunism, acquisitiveness, are universal, ladies and gentlemen, and they are enduring. The bystander is not innocent. The bystander is complicit. These are not lessons whose importance fades. The third thing is that Riedelsdorf is a rightist German, but in the current political climate, he could be from anywhere. The United States, France, Britain, the Netherlands, Italy. It's important to recognize him. A conservative white man, smart enough, patriotic, uneasy, resentful, who's just had it with the current situation. The pendulum is swinging back, he insisted to me. He turned to gay rights and women's rights. All fine, all great, he said. But if gays can marry now in Germany, does what homosexuals do with each other really need to be taught in German schools? Do gender-neutral neologisms like studia render for students really need to be adopted to satisfy feminists? Our language, he insisted, is being raped for ideological reasons. Well, that reminds me of Donald Trump telling so-called values voters this week that Merry Christmas is back. Did it ever go away? And that he's embarked on the glorious defense of Judeo-Christian civilization. Speaking of reminders, an AFD campaign poster was propped in Riedelsdorf's office. We will take our country back. This slogan is the universal cry of rightist reaction. It's Trump's America first. It's Brexit. It's Marine Le Pen's nationalists against the globalists. It's behind the word of the moment, sovereignty, used 21 times, 21, by our president in his speech to the United Nations. The question arises, back from what or whom? The dark-skinned Muslim hordes, of course. In Brandenburg, as in Trump world, there's also plenty of political energy against globalized, mealy-mouthed, inequality-fostering, immigrant-embracing elites with their gender spectra, climate doomsdays, multilateral organizations, mainstream parties, and smug alternative laws, no alternatives view of politics. I think we may, of course, we must fight the rightist xenophobes on every front and with all our energy and conviction and smarts. We must also, I think, recognize the failures of our Western democracies that led to the wave of people clamoring now for disruption at any cost. Disruption at any cost. That's Trump. It's not that people were deluded about who he is. It's that they were prepared to roll the dice. They were prepared to take the risk. They knew he could lead us into a nuclear war, but they were prepared to roll the dice. So desperate were they for disruption. We need to look this in the eye. If we don't, I suspect that Donald Trump will win a second term. And these failures, in my view, include the impunity of political and financial elites through 2008 and the Euro crisis, rising inequality, the widening gulf between wired, globalized metropolises and a stagnant periphery, the tribal lurch of societies where the commons have shrunk almost to non-existence, and the contagion of contempt of each tribe for the other. You know, sometimes I wonder if what I write twice a week, and believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, that's a lot. It may not seem it, but it is. I wonder if what I write ever reaches the people I most covet. Who are they? Those who disagree with me, yet might just be swayed. We live in our tribes, and changing your mind is just so 20th century. If our German Jewish heritage means anything, it must surely mean that we believe in conversation and argument in what Amos Oz and his daughter Fania Oz Salzberger have called the intergenerational quizzing that ensures the passing of the torch. It must mean that we are bound by a covenant of ethics in which Rabbi Hillel's injunction 
that which is hateful to yourself, do not do to your fellow man, stands front and center. Tolerance and the capacity to mediate disagreement, not race-baiting incitement, stand at the core of any liberal civilization worth its name. Now, my family story, to which William alluded um, with regard to my latest book, of repetitive upheaval and displacement, like that of millions of other Jews, leads inexorably to Zionism. By the early 20th century, no alternative offered a plausible chance of Jewish survival and belonging. As Joseph Roth once wrote, if there is one nation that is justified in seeing the national question as essential to its survival, then surely it's the Jews who are forced to become a nation by the nationalism of others. Zionism was a necessary break with past pogrom and persecution. After the Holocaust, it was a form of imperative. That is why I'm a Zionist. Yet Zionism was fraught from the start with danger. It was a secular movement, initially scorned by Talmudists, bent on the recovery of land steeped in religious symbolism. Moreover, it sought a land that was not empty. Zionist resolution of the Jewish question could only give birth to the Palestinian question. And here we are, almost 70 years later, German-Jewish conciliation has been accompanied by Jewish-Palestinian confrontation. Blood has never ceased to flow. To this, we cannot, must not, close our eyes. The situation in Israel-Palestine today constitutes a rebuke to the German-Jewish conscience. The fundamental battle in Israeli society is now the confrontation between the state of laws envisaged in 1948 and the messianic, nationalist, religious, ideological zealotry that recognizes only the word of God as expressed in the Torah and views greater Israel, views greater Israel as the realization of biblical prophecy. The secular Zionism of 1948 has been largely hijacked. Because the zealots interpret the 1967 victory that extended Israel's border to the Jordan River as the expression of God's will, and because they see the vast settlement enterprise on the land they call Judea and Samaria in the same light, the threat to Israeli democracy has steadily grown. A democracy engaged in the subjugation and routine humiliation of millions of disenfranchised Palestinians living beyond an invisible line and adjacent to other people, the settlers, who have full citizens' rights because they happen to be Jews, cannot avoid, over time, corruption and corrosion. And that is the problem underlying Israeli society, such a remarkable success in so many other regards. The experience of the past several months, the attacks from President Trump on a free press, on an independent judiciary, on openness, on truth itself, have given Americans a taste of the intensifying illiberal assault on democracy that Israelis have endured for several years now. The 50-year occupation has exacted a heavy toll. As the late Yitzhak Rabin once observed, the settlers are, quote, a cancer in the body of Israeli democracy. Israeli media have been under attack from the right-wing government of Prime Minister Netanyahu. They're not alone. So have immigrants and Bedouins and minorities and NGOs and LGBTQ people and an open society and even the rule of law. A vibrant, open Israeli democracy, ladies and gentlemen, is essential to the hope of peace. If Israeli democracy dies, the two-state hope dies with it. Everything is linked, you see. If the rule of law is trampled in Israel, no force on earth will stop settlers and their backers claiming all the land between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River. They will say this is God's will. But it was not God's will that brought Israel into being. It was United Nations Resolution 181 of 1947 calling for the partition of Mandate Palestine into two states, one Jewish and one Arab. And that is the legal basis 
the modern state of Israel. And behind that expression of the world's will lay the hard work and resourcefulness of the secular Zionists who had concluded, rightly in my view, the Jews would never be safe until they were masters of their own fate on a small patch of earth. The same Zionists who crafted Israel's founding charter of 1948 with its commitment to complete equality of social and political rights to all its inhabitants, irrespective of religion, race, or sex. Benjamin Netanyahu has played a destructive game for more than two decades. He's the master of kick the can down the road. His most unpardonable act, in my view, is to have flirted with the religious fanatics after the Oslo Accords and so helped inflame the atmosphere in which Baruch Goldstein in Hebron and Yigal Amir in Tel Aviv acted, the first slaughtering 29 Palestinians, the second assassinating Prime Minister Rabin. Netanyahu had compared Rabin to Chamberlain. He'd led rallies where the chants labeled Rabin a traitor. He'd sided with incitement. This was Bibi's fatal attraction. In a sense, I believe Israel has never recovered from Rabin's assassination, the most unthinkable of tragedies. We were invited by William to think about what would have happened if Weimar had survived as a counterfactual experiment. Imagine if Rabin had survived and with Yasser Arafat had managed to move forward. Personally, I believe they would have gotten there and everything would be different. It was, as I said, the most unthinkable of tragedies. It still brings tears to my eyes. It was so avoidable, and at the same time, so inevitable. Avoidable in that Amir slipped through the cracks and loitered for 40 minutes unnoticed in that parking garage. Inevitable in that Israel never drew the line against his ilk. The nation's ambiguity about maximalist territorial claims backed by messianic zealotry, proved disastrous. Jew killed Jew, settlers doubled in number since 1995, peace died. This was a successful assassination. The ethno-nationalist religious ideologues got the upper hand over pragmatists and never really relinquished it. Tolerance ebbed, contact between Israelis and Palestinians shrunk, a second intifada and three Gaza wars yielded more of the blood that feeds the gyre of violence. Palestinian democracy was still born in 2005. Its national movement split between Fatah and Hamas, its leadership increasingly ineffective. The status quo, an illusory term really, in that it masks steady deterioration and intermittent killing, continued in all its bleak and radicalizing aridity. I told you that I'm a Zionist. Israel must be defended, but not any Israel. One day, we know not when, the country will return to the conviction that drove Rabin, the necessity of compromise with the other people in the Holy Land, the Palestinians, in the name of peace, dignity, and the generations to come. As Amos Oz wrote after Rabin's assassination, there is simply no alternative to historic compromise between Arabs and Jews. In the end, ladies and gentlemen, it's pretty simple. We're Jews. We know as no other people what it is to be cast out, to be persecuted, to wander without a homeland. This over millennia was our fate. And everywhere we carried with us that covenant with a formless, faceless God, a covenant of ethics. Remember that verse from Hebrews? Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. How abject it would be if this covenant, with its powerful idea that strangers come from God, may even be a gift from God, held only when we were weak, but was abandoned when we became strong. With strength, as we've seen, comes the temptation of force, Control of another people breeds the contempt of the powerful to the oppressed. It's unavoidable. It can't be avoided. There is no way around it. And Israel today reflects a half century of that. You know, the assassins of Lincoln, of Gandhi, of Kennedy and King failed 
in that the ideas they tried to destroy resisted. We cannot forever let Yigal Amir be the exception and have his way. That commitment, too, must be part of our 21st century German Jewish history, the commitment to work still and against the odds, the gathering odds, for a two-state peace in Israel-Palestine. Now, the founders of this country knew that democracy dies without vigilance. A republic, if you can keep it, said Benjamin Franklin after the Constitutional Convention of 1787, when asked what form of governance had been adopted. That admonition for Americans has acquired particularly, particular urgency of late. Never, I think, has so much vigilance been demanded in keeping it. The 600,000 plus new subscribers to my newspaper, the New York Times this year, demonstrate that, I believe. No, Mr. Bannon, we will not shut up. No, Mr. Trump, we will not surrender our First Amendment rights or cease to believe there is a difference between fact and falsehood. You do not become President of the United States without some talent. Donald Trump is a man of formidable feral intuitions, allied to a fiendish energy. He saw, helped by Steve Bannon, that multiple American fears could be fused into a winning platform. Demographic fear, the end within the next couple of decades of America's white majority. Economic fear, the dislocations of globalization. Cultural fear of the urban elite who, some believe, want to chase guns and God out of our country. Primal fear, the white flip out over having a black president. Fear of the stranger, those immigrant hordes. Fear of nationalist, national decline, Chinese power rising, and those endless post 9-11 wars without victory. Fear of the future, automation and the end of work. Fear of terrorism, the Muslim jihadi amongst us. Fear of speaking your mind, the liberal tyranny of the politically correct. Take all this, inject the potent galvanizing force of Fox News, wrap it in a heavy dose of angry nationalism and drain the swamp elite bashing and a winning guerrilla offensive was there to be mounted. And so it was, and Donald Trump is in the White House. Now, Mr. Trump acts from the Oval Office as a tribal leader above all. His inflammatory style is designed to rouse the mob. He shows contempt for truth. He's refused to condemn unequivocally a murderous neo-Nazi and white supremacist act in Charlottesville, where right is chanted, Jews will not replace us. His attacks on the very foundations of our democracy, including the judiciary and the press, have been very troubling. Just this past week, President Trump tweeted, with all the fake news coming out of NBC and the networks, at what point is it appropriate to challenge their license? Bad for country. This, ladies and gentlemen, is Putin Erdogan territory. We don't know yet how far the president is prepared to go in silencing critics who do not meet his test of patriotism. We do know that he had little idea of what his oath to the Constitution meant. We also know that his base, some 35% of Americans, continue to support him strongly. I'm often asked what the likelihood is that President Trump will be impeached. And I have taken to replying that I think the likelihood of his being impeached is lower than the likelihood of his being a two-term president. I think both are relatively unlikely. I would put the chances of his being a two-term president at around 20%, and the chances of his being impeached at less than 10%. A republic, if you can keep it. I had an alarming experience last month. Let me tell you about it. The president had lied about two phone calls, one from the president of Mexico and one from the head of the Boy Scouts. They were both supposed to be congratulatory calls, one about his brilliant speech, uh, to the Boy Scouts and one about having improved the situation at the border. There was just one issue. 
The calls never happened. They never took place. They were pure inventions. And asked if our president had lied, the White House press secretary, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, said, I wouldn't say it was a lie. And you know what? I actually remember shrugging. It was the shrug that was terrifying to me. Because this is how autocrats, or would-be autocrats, cement their power. They wear you down. They take you down the rabbit hole. They want you to read 2 plus 2 equals 5 and shrug. They want you to react to an election result in 1933, bringing the National Socialists to power in Germany with a shrug. A shrug that says, these are buffoons. They'll soon be gone. Please, ladies and gentlemen, don't shrug. As a naturalized American, I took the oath to support and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I like to think that maybe in some small way I do that twice a week with my column. The President's oath, too, is to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. It's an oath to the law, to the law, not to the folk. Trump got it wrong. He got it wrong in his inaugural speech when he said, the oath of office I take today is an oath of allegiance to all Americans. No, sir, it is not. We know where folkish allegiance can lead. That is a very beautiful, a very beautiful and subtle concept. It's at the heart of the American idea that we're a nation of laws, that all Americans, whatever their beliefs or faiths, have rights and responsibilities under the law, and that this law establishes checks and balances designed to safeguard our freedom and our democracy and our openness, the values we carry out into the world in the belief that if they cannot always deliver the best, they may at least avert the worst. I fear that President Trump has no real understanding of this American idea, of its importance, of its centrality to the peace and security and prosperity we have on the whole, on the whole, I underline it, lived since 1945. He's more drawn to autocrats, a Saudi king, President Putin, than he is to a democratic elected leader like Chancellor Merkel. He trashes the institutions, NATO and the European Union, through which liberty, democracy, and the rule of law have brought an end to Europe's collective suicides of the 20th century. Trumpism, therefore, poses a particular problem for Germany, more acute than for any other European nation. Because you see, the Bundesrepublik is America's child. It was forged under American tutelage and inspired by high American ideals of liberty. If the United States has forsaken these ideals under President Trump for machismo and pay up now mercantilism, Germany will one day have to think again. So let us do everything we can to assure that German Jewish history in the 21st century is American German Jewish history, cemented by the transatlantic bonds that have extended the reach of freedom and secured peace on the European continent in my lifetime. Now in conclusion, on the way back from Brandenburg last month, after that AFD meeting I talked to you about, a terrible storm erupted. Loads were blown off trucks, trees came down, the roads were a mess, it took me a long time to get back. And one of those trees that came down killed Silke Temple, a prominent foreign policy expert and passionate Atlanticist in Berlin. That storm, so strange, almost otherworldly. I'd lived in Berlin for three years, from 98 to 2001. Never seen anything like it. I got back to near the Wannsee, where I was staying. The Wannsee is normally a placid lake. It looked like the North Atlantic in a storm. And this storm felt like some kind of warning in its strangeness, in its eerie force. You know, my father and uncle were hoisted as young men in their 20s, out of faraway South Africa to join the Allied war effort. Jewish kids summoned back to the continent <clears throat> my family had left in time. My uncle, Bert Cohen, of the 6th South African Armored Division, 19th Field Ambulance, 
gave me his war diary, chronicling the Italian campaign. On July 21, 1944, he arrived at Monte Cassino, abandoned by German forces a week earlier after repeated Allied assaults. <clears throat> he had this to say, poor Cassino, horror, wreck, and desolation unbelievable, roads smashed and pitted, mines, booby traps, and graves everywhere. Huge shell holes, craters filled with stagnant slime, smashed buildings, hardly outlines remaining, a silent sight of ghosts and shadows. Pictures should be taken of this monument to mankind's worst moments and circulated through every schoolroom in the world. And circulated, I would suggest, to the Oval Office today, where there is so much nuclear brinkmanship today. War should not be, should never be, taken lightly. I've covered wars. I know what they look like. It is for the young to reinvent the world. That is as it should be, but let us never forget. The fundaments of the Western liberal tradition, so dear to Leo Beck himself, whom we recall today, cannot be taken for granted. Those values rooted in the Enlightenment of humanism and secularism and the embrace of reason over superstition are inseparable from the LBI where we are today, just as they were inseparable from the 19th and early 20th century emancipation of German Jews. Let us guard and protect those values <coughs> always. Fight reawakened anti-Semitism and recall as we do so that it's Muslim immigrants who may be most in need of protection very often today. <clears throat> I'm a child of South Africa, my parents' birthplace, and the country where I spent my infancy <clears throat> before my father, disgusted by apartheid, took us off to Britain. But we returned regularly, and catastrophe always loomed, inevitable as the sunset. Those Johannesburg swimming pools of my relatives would turn red with blood. Out of the distant, fetid, desperate townships, the black majority would rise up to claim what was theirs and avenge the cruel injustice of apartheid. My family, along with four million other whites, would be chased out. <clears throat> well, and this is a fundamental lesson for me, the bloodbirth didn't happen thanks to the leadership of Nelson Mandela and F.W. de Klerk. Statesmanship these days, ladies and gentlemen, is an old-fashioned word, almost quaint, but no less important for that. The worst is not inevitable. The destructive gyre of wound and vengeance can be overcome. I am, in the end, and after all, and you may hardly believe me at this point, an optimist. <laughs> A Lithuanian, South African, British, American Jew who, strangely, dislikes walls and fences and borders. Now, why would that be? And believes that more will fall than be built in the 21st century, in the end. I love these lines about Jerusalem by the Israeli poet Yehuda Amakai. A group of tourists was standing around their guide, and I became their target marker. You see that man with the baskets? Just right of his head, there's an arch from the Roman period. Just right of his head. But he's moving. He's moving. I said to myself, redemption will come only if their guide tells them. You see that arch from the Roman period? It's not important. But next to it, left and down a bit, there sits a man who's bought fruit and vegetables for his family. It's not the ancient arch that counts, you see, however beautiful. It's food for our children and the peace to enjoy it. German-Jewish reconciliation, the impossible achievement, was attained through that conviction. History is there to be studied, learned from, and when necessary, overcome. I return to Hillel. If I'm not for myself, who will be for me? But if I am only for myself, who am I? If not now, when? 
A better future is there to be imagined and willed. It is there because decency demands it. And as Albert Camus, one of my favorite authors, observed, the only way to fight the plague is with decency. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> So, <clears throat> thank you, thank you, Roger, so, so much. It's so much for us to learn and think about. Please, we'll have more conversation with the reception in the Great Hall. Thank you.